I have here an article from Scientific American Mind magazine. So this is November 2007. The lead article here it says, Brighter Brains. The article is from a book by James R. Flynn, Cambridge University Press, 2007. He studied intelligence all of his life long. Probably knows as much about testing IQ as anybody around. And he says that in the United States, we have evidence from this country showing that if our current IQ tests were given to somebody a hundred, a little over a hundred years ago in the year 1900, their IQ probably would have been in 1900 about 50 or 70 at best on our current IQ test. 70 is really low. That's more or less the imbecile stage. 50 is just, you know, it's too low to think about. The increase in IQ has all come about in abstract thinking. If you talked to somebody in 1900, you wouldn't notice that they were dumb. They were quite capable of talking about concrete things. He also mentions, for example, that chess grandmasters are getting younger, yet the standard for play in tournaments continues to rise. I remember when I was a kid, I had a piano teacher, and she used to talk about how much change there had been in piano players, and pianists in the older days who couldn't play the passages that even students nowadays in, in a place like Juilliard School of Music would play easily. Here I just happened to stumble across a quote from Goethe, and he says, In former centuries, says Goethe, the great views on life were conceived in concrete forms. Today we conceive of them as abstract ideas. Now that's Goethe speaking. So this is a process that's been going on for a very long time. Well, things began to change. I happen to have here an article just came out yesterday in the local paper, the North County Times. This is by Rich Lowry. And he's talking about how personal income has changed over the centuries. He says that from about 1000 BC to AD 1800, there was no increase in personal income. Then he says, then income per person explodes upward around 1800. And how poor the average person in the world of 1800 was no better off than the average person of 100,000 years ago. Life expectancy was no higher in 1800 than for the hunter-gatherers. 30 to 35 years. Stature, a measure of both quality of diet and children's exposure to disease, was higher in the Stone Age than in 1800. <laughs> and it goes on. So at least from 1800, something happened around 1800 that's a big change. Let's go back and look at the 1800s. I have here a book that's called The Ghost Map. This is a little uh, episode that took place in the 1840s. This is from the heart of East End of London. So there's a heap of dung the size of a tolerably large house and an artificial pond into which the contents of the cesspits are thrown. In other words, people, even as recently as in the middle of the 19th century, now there were people, when I was born, there were people alive who were born before that time. So it hasn't been all that long ago that people were throwing their sewage right out onto the streets in Europe. Now, how dark were the Dark Ages? Oh, my goodness, it was really, really, really terrible. I have here a book. This is AD 1000 by Richard Erdos, an observer of 1000 AD that wrote, Sons murdered fathers, husbands killed wives, sisters fought brothers for possession of a castle. Said also there are widespread cannibalism. Parents ate their children. Robbers, this is on page 6. Robbers not only waylaid hapless travelers, but also devoured them. Glaber relates tales of hosts murdering their guests for their flesh. He mentions parts of human bodies being sold in the markets. Bird corpses being dug up and roasted. It says, one can get an idea of the suffering this perpetual state of guerrilla warfare inflicted on rich and poor, town folk and serfs alike, by looking at a Catalonian decree intended to bring about the truce of God. Among deeds abhorrent and unlawful were the killing and maiming of people who had sought sanctuary inside of churches, violating nuns, and wounding unarmed clerics. 
burning cloisters, destroying traps, and so on. Decree also stipulated that one should leave at least a poor peasant one horse for plowing and not mutilate him severely for trifling reasons, nor take all of his and his wife's clothes and all his wax and honey from the beehives. It says that if it is necessary to plunder and harass them, then to do so only in the daylight. In other words, it was considered acceptable to burn and ravage on weekdays, steal a man's livestock, as uh, long as one left him a single nag for plowing, rape women if they were not nuns, take a man's last shirt but leave him his loincloth, and mutilate a man lightly, perhaps by putting out only one of his eyes instead of two. That's what the Dark Ages was like. So that was 1000 A.D. Things even got worse before that, back to 500 A.D. We really have very little. In fact, the, 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 the term Dark Ages comes into our vocabulary because the historians have so little written about that, that era. Almost nobody knew how to read and write. So they have no written records of those ages, and that's why the historians have called that period around 500 to 800 A.D. the Dark Ages. But then when you go backwards before 500 A.D., you see things starting getting better. And, of course, we all know about the Greeks who lived a thousand years before that time, and they had quite a high civilization. And if you go back to the Egyptians, they did some amazing things. Normally, I wouldn't be wanting to read a book like this, Forbidden History. I'm such a skeptic, but somehow or another, I... I uh, did wind up buying this book, and most of it, I must say, is, is not credible, at least in my opinion. But there are some passages which, uh, which really stand out. Christopher Dunn, he's an engineer. That The title is An Engineer in Egypt. The hieroglyphs are so amazingly precise. The grooves are square and deeper than they are wide. Deeper than they are wide. They follow precise contours, and some have grooves that run parallel to each other with only a 0.03-inch wide wall between the grooves. That's a little bit less than 1 32nd of an inch. He also talks about tubular drilling. He says, these are the most clearly astounding and conclusive evidence yet presented to identify with little doubt the knowledge and technology in existence in prehistory regarding tool marks that left a spiral groove on a cord taken out of a hole drilled into a piece of granite. He wrote, the spiral of the cut sinks one-tenth of an inch in a circumference of six inches, or one in 60. If you were to do this nowadays, the only possible drill would be an ultrasonic drill. The argument here is that ancient Egyptians must have had something like an ultrasonic drill. Pyramids. Almost all the stones are heavier than the van that we drive. And these stones were lifted to a height of a total of 480 feet. But that's not the most impressive aspect of the pyramids for me. It's the cladding. These pyramids were covered in polished stones. And the stones were so tight-fitting that the tip of a knife blade would not fit between the cracks. How do we know? Because the coffee pyramid still has some of its cladding stones at the top, and you cannot even slide a razor blade in the cracks, even after thousands of years. And there's no mortar in those joints. Then there's also the question of the passageway. It's 350 feet long, a descending passageway that goes down into the pyramid. And its sidewalls are so straight that they deviate from a straight line less than one-eighth of an inch over a distance of about 350 feet. And the ceiling is sagged just a little bit over the distance of 350 feet and over the passage of many thousands of years. It now has a deviation from a straight line of about three-tenths of an inch. So this is amazingly precise workmanship for people who would have had supposedly only Stone Age tools. But that descending passageway and the cladding, those are all soft stones. Could have been worked if people had enough time, one would suppose. But let's look at these giant boxes that are found, one of which is found in the Khafre Pyramid. These boxes are really huge. They're hewn out of solid stone. This one measures over 13 feet long, over 7 feet wide, and over 9 feet tall. 
Yet when Christopher Dunn checked the surfaces with precision instruments, he found that they deviate from perfectly flat less than two ten thousandths of an inch over any 12-inch line that he checked. How much is two ten thousandths of an inch? About one-twelfth the thickness of a human hair. Moreover, he checked the corners for square with a square that was calibrated to five one-hundred thousandths of an inch, and he found three of the four corners were almost perfect, and the remaining corner deviated from perfectly square only about one thousandth of an inch over a twelve-inch line. He was even more impressed with the corners. He found that the inside radius of the corners was only one-eighth of an inch. Now he asks, how can you get this kind of precision if you're just bashing it with a diorite ball and then grinding on it with stone tools and sand? He says, you must have had some kind of precision instruments to produce this kind of precision. In fact, even today it would have been a stretch to reproduce these boxes. He went to four precision granite manufacturing companies and asked them if they could replicate these boxes, and they all said no. He was even more impressed with the curves that were similarly precise. Here is a convex curve and a concave curve, and he says that these were ground to the same precision that were found on the flat surfaces of the boxes. He also found one that was curving on three axes rather than just two. And I'm sorry, I don't have the capability of drawing these with my 3D drawing program, but you can see a photograph of the object on his website. So all in all, he says, the ancient Egyptians had to have had high-technology machines. I'm not going to argue the case one way or the other about whether or not they had this high technology, but what is clear is that the ancients in Egypt did things that even later generations of Egyptians couldn't do. Well, you might say, okay, so the Egyptians could do some pretty fancy stuff with stone, but after all, it's just stone. It's not something subtle like brain surgery. Well, this is a circular saw that I own. It's not much good for working on stone, but it might work on a skull. But if you search the word for trephination history or something of the sort, you'll come up with a lot of hits, and here's one of them. Trephination in history. Primitive cranial trephining, the surgical opening of the skull performed with primitive tools and techniques, is one of the most fascinating surgical practices in human history. It probably started in the Neolithic at least 7,000 years ago. The person who wrote that and put it up on the web is Clark Johnson, doctor of dental surgery and Ph.D., and he's at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Dentistry. And speaking of dentistry, if you look up into civilization on wikipedia.com, you'll find this statement. In April 2006, it was announced in the scientific journal Nature that the oldest and first early Neolithic evidence for the drilling of human teeth in vivo, that is, in a living person, was found in Mergar. Eleven drilled molar crowns from nine adults were discovered in a Neolithic graveyard. The dates from 7,500 to 9,000 years ago. According to the authors, their discoveries point to a tradition of proto-dentistry in the early farming cultures of that region. Well, brain surgery is important for a few people. Repair of broken skulls, that's important occasionally for a few people. Dentistry is obviously a more important advance for human health care. But in the long history of human health, what has been the most important invention? According to a survey of medical practitioners, the answer is... Ooh, what a gratifying sound. All of civilization goes down the drain if you don't have good sanitation. Sanitation has had a rocky history. We already talked about the human dung that was stacked up in the streets of London. Admittedly, the Muslim Middle East did much better than Europe. They valued cleanliness. At an earlier date, sanitation looks even better. And Rome had public baths. But... 
If you go back to ancient India, they had private baths for every single home.